Seven Fatal Delusions Among Southerners by Moses Oliadil Edu Published June 5, 2021 A great deal of intelligence can be invested in ignorance when the need for illusion is deep. Saul Bellow A delusion is a serious thing. It is worse than deception and much more fatal in its consequences. The word delusion comes from the Latin word delusio, which means a false belief that is resistant to confrontation with actual facts. That is the best definition of delusion that I can find. Let me give one major example of delusion in history and the fatal consequences it brought. During the invasion of Palestine by the Roman army under Titus in 68 AD, did the Jews succumb to delusion that proved to be fatal. After resisting the Romans stoutly for two years the siege finally succeeded in 70 AD when the Roman legions poured in to deal with this troublous race. By now there was no more food and as Josephus, the famous Jewish historian narrated even people were eating raw grass or anything they could find. Still, they refused to surrender and fought on defending their holy city and most especially their holy temple. By now the Christians, the sect of the Nazarene, as they were called, had deserted knowing that Christ had already prophesied this thing must come to pass, thus causing the eternal distrust and rift which still exists between Jews and Christian relations till today. But the Jewish patriots and nationalists fought on to the last and to their ruin. It was here the major fatal delusion was enacted. The Roman soldiers now inside the battle now finally shifted to the temple. Believing that the God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the holy prophets, Moses and Elijah would save the temple and even them and remember his covenant with their fathers many ran into the temple as a shield. But the day of the temple has gone. A new dispensation had dawned where God no longer dwells in physical temples but in living temples built with living stones, a house made without hands. He now lives in humans, created in his own image. Thus rushing to the temple for salvation before the Romans was a delusion, a fatal delusion. It was here most Jews perished defending the temple and using it as a defense. The Romans slaughtered on and set the temple ablaze. They expected God to show up and defend his temple, but he didn't because the nation herself had committed sins by crucifying an innocent person and the day of revenge had come. Looking to the temple for protection was a delusion. Today a gargantuan mock stands around the very spot where that temple once stood. I have prefaced this essay with this story because it seems people rarely learn from history. It seems to me that another group of people is about to suffer very soon as a result of grand delusions, false beliefs that are resistant to confrontation with facts. And most southerners presently suffer from these delusions. They are seven in all, and I will briefly go over them because of time and space. One. That Britain will intervene in Nigeria or restrain Muhammadu Buhari. The first delusion is that Britain, that treacherous nation called Britain will intervene in Nigeria and help us in any way. When the National Christian Elders Forum wrote to British Parliament, I noted this in an article. It is a mistake to think or expect that Britain will enter Nigeria or intervene in any way that will help the South against the North. It won't happen. To think that Britain or the British will come here to help the South is a delusion. They won't. British design originally is that the North will rule and dominate the South, not vice versa. Their sympathy was and still is with the North, not the South. If you don't know this, then you don't know much about Nigerian history or you probably forgot what you learned. Thus I consider it a mistake to report Buhari to Britain. It is like reporting the Italian brigades to the Beda Main of Gang or reporting the Hamas of Palestine to the Hezbollah of Lebanon. It is a waste of time. 2. That the United States under Joe Biden will intervene in Nigeria if there is a conflict. Another terrible delusion among most Southerners is that America would come here to intervene if there is trouble between North and South or even a civil war. They won't. When Buhari requested Americans to cite the headquarters of their African command closer here to help us I wrote, why Americans won't come here. They could go to Egypt or even South Africa, Lebanon, etc. but not Nigeria. I know how America works. I have read about that nation, her politics, power play, history, literature, religion, etc. for several years and I can tell you one thing, 
Americans won't come here. You may continue to delude yourself to the contrary. 3. That the United Nations will do anything if war breaks out or send a peacekeeping force here. The worst of all these delusions and the most dangerous is the over-reliance on the United Nations by the ethnic nationalist agitators. They seem to have an unbending belief in the United Nations to give them the Odujua Republic and Biafra and Middle Belt etc. Is it that our land people and scholars do not understand how the world works? And how the United Nations especially work? Who will enforce the decree of the United Nations? Of what use is a United Nations without the support of America and Britain? How many of the Security Council members of the UN has the military power to enforce a decision of the UN in Nigeria? So if the North or Nigeria occupies the new Biafra nation or Odujua nation, who will throw them out? Or do you think it is like Kuwait that America would go to throw away a rock? There is nothing you have that America needs. That is why I consider this the greatest of the delusions and the one that will prove most fatal. I expected that someone working on the Odujua Republic would have its own people's militia at the ready, just in case. Today, I can see nothing. General Togan alerted us yesterday that an invasion of the Southwest is imminent. And barring a divine intervention, we may face this cause soon. But you should have foreseen this coming and prepared for this. Three years ago, I warned the Yoruba in particular and the Southerners, in general, to set up their own people's militia. How many paid heeds to it? Now I am afraid it is now late, too late for the Yorubas. You are surrounded. United Nations won't help you in what is coming because without the firepower of the Americans United Nations is nothing especially when it comes to a populous nation like Nigeria and Americans won't come here except probably to evacuate their citizens and embassy staff. The United Nations could have stopped the genocide in Rwanda or at least mitigated it, what did the body do? French army watched as one African tribe massacred another in one week of madness without using force to intervene or stop the madness. United Nations is as strong as America and Britain decide to make it. Of all the resolutions made by the UN against Israel, how many of them have been enforced? Who will enforce them without America the only superpower now on the planet? That is why I think the South is making a terrible mistake in strategy. That the UN intervened in Sudan and split the nation does not mean they would do the same here. Sudan is not Nigeria and Nigeria is not Sudan. 4. That writing letters or staging protests will change the Buhari administration or cause it to move against the Fulani headsmen or bandits. There is a belief that Muhammadu Buhari is not really aware of what is going on and that much of this information do not get to him. That the president is actually a good man but with bad advisors. And so on. I consider this to be pernicious nonsense. I do not have the luxury of time to probe this deeply here. However, there is a common mistake Nigerians often make which brought us here, to begin with. People confuse knowledge with attitude. Knowledge or know-how is one thing and culture, attitude or behavior is another. You can teach a man who doesn't know if he is willing to learn but it is difficult to change a man, and a man above 70 for that matter, of his beliefs, culture, attitude, and dispositions. Buhari's insularity and provincialism fuel his attitude to even state affairs, and these are the product of his Islamic fundamentalist belief system and Wahhabist ideology. It is not that he is not aware that the constitution provides for ethnic balancing in the area of appointments to strategic positions and offices. He knows. But as an Islamic fundamentalist, he doesn't believe that a Muslim is equal or should have equal representation with a non-Muslim. He did it in 1984 all the three topmost positions in the Supreme Military Council, head of state, his deputy, and the chief of staff were all Muslims. He has done it in 2015 appointments and has worsened even in 2019. This man cannot change and will never be changed. Thinking that he would change in 2019 brought Nigeria to this mess when we have the opportunity through that singular election to change the narrative. Thus, writing letters, organizing protests, etc. would change nothing. Buhari would do nothing against the Fulani headsmen and bandits even if they became more brutal than they presently are. 
It is left for you to find answers for yourself. 5. That anything short of force, adequate, proportionate, definite force can stop the Fulani headsmen in their temporary mission of harassing, extortion and terrorism, and in their larger ultimate purpose of total invasion, religious and cultural hegemony and imposition of their way of life on other ethnic nationalities. I will give you one sign so that you may know these people are being guided and up to an agenda. Shortly after Buhari became president and all the security apparatus fell into their hands, the Fulani headsmen went haywire and began to attack other Nigerians, farmers and travelers alike. As they were attacking the roadway, so they were attacking the farms. Then suddenly something happened. I am not sure Nigerians notice because we are a people without understanding and perception, but at least one Nigerian noticed and wrote about it in the Guardian newspaper. What was it? Shortly before the election of 2019 just about the time when campaigns began the Fulani headsmen stopped their atrocities. It was like a ceasefire in war. It was a coordinated approach. All across the nation, you couldn't hear of a single attack either against farmers or travelers while the campaign to return Buhari to power was going on. You may again go and check the newspapers of the period, you can't read of any Fulani attack against anyone. Why? It now seems they deliberately managed themselves so that Buhari could get a second term so that Nigerians won't notice anything. Now that Buhari is on for the second time, they have resumed their atrocities. This singular incident shows me conclusively that these people are being coordinated somewhere and up to some purpose. United by their common belief and entrenched in their religion, a religion that does not see anything wrong with bloodshed, slavery of infidels, warmongering, and even plunder they march on to execute their larger purpose. Now famine is imminent in the south. Now, most southern states are surrounded. A siege is the first stage in the declaration of war among the ancients. That is now happening. Farmers cannot go to farm, prices of foodstuff continue to skyrocket. The war has started but southerners enslaved by too much book learning are still embroiled in conferences, seminars, symposiums, Fantasia, papers. While every day their choices become narrower and narrower. Barring the special grace of God and divine intervention, nothing can stop the Fulani headsmen in their sinister course except equal, proportionate force. If, as Newton shows that, to every action, there is equal and opposite reaction, then it is left for the different ethnic nationalities to plan their counteraction or reaction that is equal and formidable to this existential threat to their collective survival. Buhari would do nothing about it and his government would do nothing. Either you act now or you wait for the UN at your own perils. 6. That the world will intervene if a civil war breaks out between the North and South or between Fulanis and Yorubas. This is another fallacy based on delusions of grandeur. Which world are you talking about? The world of the black man or the white man? the world of the developed nations or the backward third world nations. During the civil war, how many nations came here? They only sold arms to us. Only on the side of Biofra that France and Israel actually actively participated. They didn't send soldiers, only logistical support. That was then. The world has since changed even worse than then. No one will come here except to sell arms. The resulting demographic disaster doesn't worry the developed nations so long as it does not endanger the white skin. They may even be happy, secretly about it. 7. That Christianity is against war and self-defense. This will be the most fatal of all the delusions to the South. Since most Christians live or reside in the South. Leading this fallacious and illogical position is the Church of Rome and mostly espoused by its exegetes, the most notable of which is Bishop Cooker. It is held by the Catholic Church School of Theology that peaceful non-resistance is the way out and the Christian standard. I stand here to say that the Bible either in the New Testament or Old Testament knows nothing like pacifism or peaceful non-resistance in the face of extreme aggression and existential threat of genocide against an entire race or tribe battling for collective survival. I stand here to state and to challenge anyone who has a contrary idea to a debate that neither the New Testament nor church history knows anything as pacifism or peaceful non-resistance in the face of genocide against an entire people groups or whole races.
I would be glad if anyone can accept my offer for a debate on any platform. The Bible and historical theology never condemn self-defense or engagement in a just war, a war to remove the cause of aggression and to punish evil. From Cicero to Augustine, from Aquinas to Calvin and Luther, all the great exegetes and authorities of theology are agreed that it is proper for a people facing the existential danger of survival to defend themselves with any and every weapon they can lay their hands on. I have read Bishop Cooker on this peaceful non-resistance, but I don't know where the modern Catholic system got this. None of you in the entire Nigerian Roman Catholic Church is more Catholic than Aquina and none of you is as saintly as Augustine who first laid the theology of just war that became the governing premises of the Western nations and civilization till today. The madness in man must sometimes be answered not with persuasion or pleading but with greater madness. This is what prompted the crusade although today we have distorted their history and Islam and apologists of Islam and their newfound allies in the western universities and leftist revisionist historians now mouth plenty of nonsense about the crusaders forgetting it was the same type of provocations that triggered that movement. The madness presently going on in Nigeria will not end until it is confronted with an equal madness from the other side. Sometimes it takes madness to cure madness. That is the great lesson of the Crusades. Most of the foolish things people say to justify peaceful non-resistance are neither scriptural nor logical. If Jesus was so much against self-defense, as the authors of non-resistance tell us, what were two of his disciples doing with swords on the night of his betrayal? A sword is not an object of decoration or ornament in first century Palestine, it is an instrument of war. It is them what AK-47 is to us today. Let the pacifist answer that charge. I am aware that people are fasting and praying. I salute you all. I am praying too. But as in the days of Nehemiah, don't just pray alone, plan to with weapons girded around you and be prepared with fire and with thunder. I will not endanger anyone, and I will do no evil to anyone but anyone who intends or plans to remove me from the land of my fathers before my time from whatever religion or tribe will have himself to blame if I be a servant of the Most High God. Every ethnic nationality has a right to defend itself and raise her own militia to defend its people and spaces and land. Even churches ought to raise their own militia to defend the people who worship or come to worship there. Enough of using Christianity to justify a system of unrighteousness or proper structure of iniquity. There is nothing in apostolic Christianity that forbids a whole tribe or people groups from standing up for their lives against an aggressive enemy with a history of genocide and bloodstains. It is time for a liberation theology in Nigeria and even more confrontation theology. The minds of Christians in this nation need to be liberated from religion and slavery. That will soon be done. That is a major task ahead. Slaves won't survive what is coming, only sons will. Copyright Moses Oyedil Edu. All rights reserved. This podcast was brought to you by BG Media. Download the BG Media app today or visit barglobal.net for more podcasts.